1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And I want to draw your attention to one verse of Scripture here as we're working our way verse by verse through this, as I said last week, very rich epistle of 1 Peter. I want to look at verse 17 of chapter 2. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. It simply reads as the Apostle Peter commands us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the King. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for its richness, its boldness. And this morning, Lord, as we hear this fourfold command by your holy word, may we be changed by it. I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, and that these words that are being spoken from behind this pulpit today would be helpful to your people, for your church, to the praise of your name, for our good and for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. I want you to think this morning about the many relationships that you have in your life. It's probably more than you think of just off the top of your head, but if you start to think, I'm talking about all of your different relationships. Uh, for those of you that are married, your relationship with your spouse. For those of you that have children, your relationship with your children. That relationship that you have with your parents that relationship that you have with your brothers and sisters, that relationship that you have with your brothers and sisters in Christ, with your fellow church members, that relationships that you have with your neighbors, those relationships that you have with your friends, those relationships that you have with your co-workers, those relationships that, with, that you have with the local authorities, with the civil magistrates, as I've been calling them, the, the, the police, the, uh, the uh, board of supervisors, the Building and Zoning uh, Commission, the mayor, the governor, the president, those relationships that you have with people that you might just run into at Walmart, that person that checks you out at the grocery store, that person that you pay at the gas station, the person even, that relationship with the person that you might even be passing or is passing you on the road, and, of course, your relationship with God. We have many relationships in our life, don't we? Many of them are different. And the Bible speaks to them all. It tells us how we are to live. It tells us how we are to uh, live in a world with other people. And especially this verse, we see it's sort of boiled down into a fourfold command where Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us how we are to relate in these various different types of relationships that we have. And so I want to look at, follow along with what Peter is saying here in these, this fourfold command. He just simply says, and I'll, I'll just repeat uh, the verse, which is kind of my own translation if it didn't sound exactly uh, like yours, because I wanted to put it in that pithiness of the text that Peter is writing here when he simply says, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, Fear God, honor the king, or the emperor, or whatever you want to call him. And so he gives us that fourfold command. And I, want to, I want to look at each one of those four and think about it biblically, theologically, maybe look at some things that it's not saying, hopefully that'll be helpful, and how some various ways that we are to apply, apply these commands, these simple, straightforward commands to our life. And so let's begin with the first one where Peter simply says, Honor everyone. Honor everyone. Now this is one of those times when the Bible uses everyone or the word all there. Actually, if your translation says honor all men, that all men is sort of men is there is is included. And so don't think, it's, it's not actually not in the text. So when I say everyone, don't think that I'm monkeying with the text, trying to make it general neutral. 
in a place that it's not. It actually is gender neutral in this place. Uh, it actually doesn't even say people. It just says pantos is the Greek word, which is the word for all. We have to imply that he's talking about all people. He's talking about all people without distinction and without exception. This is all people without exception. It's all people we are to show honor to. Now, as simple as that statement may sound on the surface, if I might jump straight into a little bit of a mention of application and then come back to look at it biblically and then end with application, it is an, an issue that a lot of people are confused about today on how we are to relate to different kinds of people people in different stations of life, people that are different than us. How are we to relate? And there's a lot of very unhelpful things being said in our generation today that we'll get to before we're done with this point. But we must, as believers, start with what the Bible says. It's, it's very grieving to me that in our current generation that so many people are uh, in, even that are calling themselves evangelical who claim to be standing upon the word of God are so quick to run to the way that the world call, uh, tries to solve problems and just kind of bring it into the church and kind of color it with some uh, Christianist sounding language but it's really a secular philosophy and sort of roll their eyes at those of us that say, no, what does the Bible actually say? And so let's, not, uh, so let's not take anything for granted here and just start where the Bible starts. And that, of course, takes us back to the book of Genesis. Here's the question. Why are we to honor everyone? The simple answer is it's because everyone, every human being, has been created in the image of God. We could read even just in the opening pages of the book of Genesis where God created human beings, male and female. He created he, them. He created them in his own image. In the Imago Dei, the image of God, every single human being has been created in the image of God. And it's a special creation. That is why they deserve dignity. That is why they deserve respect. That is why we should honor everyone, no matter who that person might be. It doesn't matter how much money they have. It, it doesn't matter if they are rich, whether they are poor, whether they are white, whether they are black, whether they are brown or some other color. Uh, they are created in the image of God. From the moment of conception, I almost said from the moment of birth, but we need to make, make, make sure that we, we don't say from the moment of birth. It, it actually begins at the moment of conception. It's not when the heartbeat is first detected. No, it is when the actual conception is actually made. I won't go into all the biology there. I'll let your parent, the parents uh, teach the children on all of those things. But we are created in the image of God. And we are to honor, respect every human life. This is something I learned early as a child. And I thank God that I have parents who train me up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I thank God that I have a, a dad, a father, that not only taught me with his words, but modeled it with his life. And I remember specifically, I was going to tell you this story, I remember specifically one particular instance. Why I remember this, I, I, I don't know. But I remember one day in particular, we were working at uh, my dad's old rent house. He, uh, my dad, my, 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 when my grandfather came back from World War II, and right when he got married, uh, they moved into a house in, in Baton Rouge, and uh, when they started having kids later, several years later, they moved into a different house, but they kept the old house uh, on McGrath Street in Baton Rouge. The house is still there to this day. They kept it and began to rent it out. And so my dad was renting it out as uh, when, when I was a kid. He rented out to people and actually had bought a, a few other houses and was doing that uh, for a while. And we would go and work on these houses sometimes. And I remember, I remember one time we roofed the house. That was an experience. Uh, Re-roofing uh, the little house. But one day we was in the back 
and working on the back porch. And uh, I remember my dad always treated the tenants with dignity and respect. Most of the time, it was this elderly black woman that lived there, and uh, he would come to the door and respect her, and, and he respected her privacy, and made sure that it was convenient for us to be there working. But the, the ep incident that I remember specifically was one day when we were working on the back porch. There was a back porch that my grandfather had closed in half of it and built a bathroom, because when they first lived there, they had an outhouse. And uh, he built a bathroom onto the back porch and closed it in. But we're working on that, and the guy from next door came over, and my dad was talking to him. Now, uh, to, to tell you about this guy, I have to be careful so that I don't undermine what I'm preaching, uh, but just so that you can have the image, uh, picture there, it was an old black guy. It was an old black man, uh, and, and I'm not trying to be derogatory at all, but he was, you know, in, in, in shabby clothes. Uh, he was old. Uh, he, he, he talked in very strong black accent, if you know what I mean. Uh, and, 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 you know, that, so you, you get the picture of this guy. And I remember my dad shaking his hand, talking to him, conversing with him, and it struck me, even as a little kid, that my dad was talking to that man with the same dignity and respect as my dad would talk to the governor and interact with the governor. He would interact with the governor in the same way that he was at, react, uh, interacting with this man who was just the poor black old neighbor that lived next door that couldn't barely string a sentence together coherently. And looked him in the eye and treated him with dignity and respect. You know why? Because my dad understood that he was a man created in the image of God. And that stuck with me. It sticks with me still to this day. When Peter says, honor everyone. Honor everyone. And so there's a, a lot of talk about racial reconciliation today and different ways that we can accomplish that. I'll tell you how we need to begin to accomplish that as believers, recognizing the Imago Dei in every single individual human being that has ever been conceived on planet Earth. That is where it must begin. But this is helpful as we read this word, not only honor everyone relating to those types of relationships, but also in various socioeconomic strata. I don't have to tell any of you in this room that there is a problem in many communities where wealthy people look down on the poorer people no matter what color they might be, right? Right? This, the snobbiness of some people is amazing as they think that they're better than somebody else just because they have a little bit more money or maybe because they have been privileged in some certain way that they look down on other people and we've all seen that. However, I've also seen, I've been around the block a few times and I've seen the other side. As much as people will say, amen, yeah, preach, Brother Don, against them snobby rich people. You know what I've found? <laughs> Poor people can be just as snobby, if not more snobby, than the rich people. I think I've heard more poor people talking bad about rich people than I've heard rich people talking bad about poor people. Now, that might just be happen to be because of the friends that I hang out with, but whatever the case, the temptation to look down on somebody because they have more money. They look down on somebody because they have a beautiful wife or they have a nice car or they've got a nice boat or live in a big house and they sort of look down on them as if they're somehow they must be the bad guy. We need to repent of that kind of snobbery. It works both ways. Because we as human beings tend to look down on people who are not like us. But if we had a right understanding of the image of God, the Imago Dei, we will begin to treat everyone equally. Now when I say we treat everyone equally, here's where I want to put a little footnote. And make sure that we don't say the right words and push it to an extent where it is not biblical at all. 
And so while I said we must begin with the Imago Day, we can't end there because the Bible says so much more. And if we just leave it at that, we might tend to come to some wrong conclusions about what this honoring everyone looks like. While we do treat everyone with dignity and respect, it would be foolhardy to think that we're supposed to treat everyone exactly the same. Now, in some respects, in some respects, I understand, don't hear me saying anything otherwise, in some respects, we are to treat everybody the same. But in other respects, we are definitely not. It depends upon their station in life. And God has made different people differently. And so, for example, well, I'll give you a silly example. And I was thinking of this, and I, had to, and I made myself laugh when I was thinking about it. And so, hopefully, it'll be helpful and make sense uh, to you. Yesterday, when I was over at Miss B's house, uh, little Jameson uh, comes in the room, Joel's uh, grandson, and he run, walks in a room. What is Jameson? About a year old or so. And he walks in the room, and I get down kind of like on, on one knee, and I say, hey, little buddy, how's it going? Give me five. And he gives me five, and I kind of tuffle his head. And that's appropriate, right? He's one years old. But if we really took seriously that we're supposed to treat everyone exactly the same, <laughs> Dave's ahead of me, right? <laughs> if Mr. Larry came in the door and I say, hey, little buddy, how's it going? Give me five and I tuffle his hair. I think that might not go over very well, right, Mr. Larry? That'd be, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous, right? And you, you might say, brother Don, that's, you're being ridiculous. You're being silly. Well, I am being silly to make a point. Different people are to be treated different ways. All with dignity, all with respect. But I'll give you a couple of biblical examples because we want to be biblical, not just logical, but biblical. The Bible tells children to obey their parents, right? The Bible never tells parents to obey their children. It's different. It's different, right? It depends upon your station in life. Your station in life. You'll hear people just throw out Jesus' words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and come up with these crazy uh, um, applications that actually go far in a different direction than what Jesus was actually telling us to do. Jesus was not telling you that if you uh, want your children to clean, you better not tell your children to clean their room because you don't want them to tell you to clean your room. No, that, that's not the logic that Jesus is using at all. Does that make sense? So different people. So the way, or if you want to take it into employer-employee relationships, you don't tell your employ, an employer, a Christian employer, shouldn't say to himself, oh, I better not tell my employee to take out the garbage because I don't want him to have to tell me to take out the garbage. And so we're supposed to do unto others as we are to do unto us. And so, no, that's not, that's not what the Bible is saying at all. Different people are different. We're to treat them with dignity. We're to treat them with respect. We're to show them honor. But that is not to explode every hierarchy in our society. It's not to do away with merit meritocracy. In other words, honor everyone does not mean everyone gets a trophy. All right? There's nothing at all wrong with a school giving a medal to the fastest fifth grader in the school. But now, what does the culture say? Oh, we better not do that because that might make the other kids feel bad. <laughs> they should. In a, in a very real day, they should because, because biblically, what that does is motivates us. Motivates us to excellence and other things. There is a difference. There is a distinction. Some people are more talented than others. Some people are, uh, are, are stronger than others. Some people are, dare I say, smarter than others. God has created all people differently. And so when we say we're to honor everyone, that does not mean that we have to flatten out our society where everyone is ensured an in, uh, in equality of outcomes. That is not what the Bible is saying at all. Even if we look at this word honor, and I'll say one more thing, there's so much more that I could say here, but we'll, we'll, we want to go on to those next three. Even with this very word honor, honor everyone, he is not implying that everyone is to get equal honor. He is saying that we shouldn't dishonor people. 
He is saying that we shouldn't disrespect people, but he's not saying that everyone should get the same equal amount of honor. Do you know how I know that? It's not a logic thing, it's a biblical issue. I won't take the time to turn, we could turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5 where the Apostle Paul uses this same exact Greek word as Peter uses here as honor. And he's talking about in the churches that those elders that are working and laboring and preaching and teaching are worthy of double honor. Double honor. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked with all that that means. Actually, there he's talking about um, getting paid and physically being taken care of and all the rest. But what I'm, what I'm wanting to point out here is he's using the word double honor. There's some people that deserve to be honored, and there's some people that we need to double honor them. Why does everyone need to be honored? Because of the Imago Dei. And then we work up from there for various stations in life, different relationships, and we understand the appropriateness of each one of those, and the Bible helps us think through of all of those things. Does that make sense, you see? So honor everyone. Number two, honor everyone. Number two is love the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Now, who is he talking about the brotherhood here? Well, he's talking about other Christians, other Christians. He uses this same terminology later in the, uh, the epistle of all the believers, or in other words, love for fellow Christians. We're to honor everyone, but then he has a distinctiveness that we ought to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. He reminds, it kind of reminds me of what P, uh, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians. When in, in, in Galatians, Paul says, do good to everyone, but especially those of the household of faith. So do good to everyone, and especially those of the household of faith. Do you hear an echo of that almost in Peter? Honor everyone, love the brotherhood. And so, so everyone, the brothers, are included in that everyone, but there's a special place for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then what, we ought to have a focus, a, a focus of attention and love. Just like a family, is when, when we say to treat everybody the same, well, well, you don't treat your neighbor's kids in the same way that you treat your kids, right? And so we're to honor everyone, but for our brothers and sisters in Christ, there is a, so a, a if I could use, the, borrow the language for the elders, the dub, a double honor that extends into a special kind of love. Love the brotherhood. This reminds me of a, if I use the word controversy, it would, it would be an overstatement. And so it wasn't really a controversy, but I remember a discussion, maybe I should say, in our church here at Lakeshore after Hurricane Katrina. And most, uh, some of you were here then, and uh, those of you that weren't, you know the stories that Lakeshore Baptist Church strove to help as many people in our community as we possibly could. And we, we sort of made a name for ourselves because of that. We wanted to help people. And so the members of Lakeshore Baptist Church bent over backwards and went the second mile to help their neighbors and their friends and their co-workers and their extended family, did all of those things. And we wanted to do that. We wanted to honor everyone, right? But then, after a little while, there was a lot of churches from all over the country wanting to come and help us. And they were standing alongside of us doing the same thing. But a few of those churches made a very specific point to tell us they wanted to help our church members. They said, Brother Don, who are your church members? We want to help them specifically. We want to work on their homes. We want to make sure their needs are met. And here's where it was uh, not really a controversy, but some of, our, some of the people, some people were like, that's not right. They shouldn't, special, they shouldn't make a special consideration for church members and show partiality and show uh, special treatment for church members instead of the whole wide community. And they were upset with me. And more than one person came to me and sort of upset about that whole, whole thing. And you know what I had to tell them? They're being biblical. They're being exactly right. When a church in Texas wanted to come and say, we want to help church members of Lakeshore Baptist Church, you know why they did that? Because they were striving to be obedient to Scripture. We don't need to apologize for that. We don't need to apologize for that. And you know, you understand uh, where we stand as a church. We have a big heart for our community. 
We desire to, to help and uh, help as many people as we possibly can. And I push back against those who believe that that is not uh, appropriate. I believe that it is. I believe that it absolutely is. That it is more than appropriate for Christians, a body of believers who are united together as a church to help the community. Uh, and, and people can accuse me of being neo-Kyperian and all sorts of, of, of things, but I believe that the Bible is very plain when it says, do good to everyone. But I believe very strongly it says, and especially the household of faith. And so if you hear accusations being leveled against the benevolent work of Lakeshore Baptist Church, it says that we show preferential treatment to our church members, that we, uh, that we do that. The truth of the matter is that's probably not the case. It's probably a lie. But even if it was, it's completely appropriate. Completely right. The, the argument against that is as silly as it is for people to say, hey, you gave your kids birthday presents, but you didn't give everybody in the neighborhood's kids for the same kind of birthday present. That's not fair. We would say, that, that's, that's ridiculous, right? Well, from a biblical worldview, it's just as ridiculous. Yes, we are to honor everyone. But Peter says... There is a special kind of love that you as believers ought to have for your brothers and sisters in Christ. We should watch out for one another. We should meet each other's needs. We need to pray for one another, hold each other up in prayer, hold each other accountable, and other things that we ought to do. In fact, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Apostle John makes this one of the tests to see if your faith is actually genuine or not. I won't take the time to turn to 1 John, but if you're familiar with the epistle of 1 John, the entire letter is written to uh, sort of examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. You know, how, how do you know that you are a Christian? And, and it's not by looking in the back of your Bible to see where you wrote down the date that you walked the aisle. That's not how you do it. What, what John says is here's how you know that you are a believer. Here's how you get assurance in your faith. First, you look to Christ. But when you start to look at yourself and examine your heart, there's three tests. He said he goes over and over this in 1 John. And I'll just summarize it. The first test is the doctrinal test. The doctrinal test is do you believe certain things? Now, salvation is not a mental ascent. It's much more than that. But there are certain things, fundamental things, that you cannot not believe and still be a Christian. If you do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you are not a believer. You are not a Christian. If you don't believe that you are a sinner, you're not a Christian. If you don't believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose on the third day, to pay the penalty for your sin, you are not a Christian. That's the doctrinal test. And John goes over several of those. Then he says that there's also a moral test. And this is, he's not saying that you have to be perfect in order to be a Christian. But how do you deal with sin in your life is the issue. Do you cover it up? Do you hide it? If so, you're not a Christian. Or do you repent of it? Do you, are you grieved over it and repent of it? and run away from sin? If so, it's a good indication that you are a believer. That's the moral test. But thirdly, and that's the point that I wanted to get to, this, the social, what, what many have called the social test. The doctrinal test, the moral test, and the social test in 1 John. The social test is, do you love the brotherhood? Do you love fellow Christians? Do you love the church? I love my friend Earl Blackburn's book, uh, Jesus Loves the Church, and So Should You. Great title, great book. Jesus Loves the Church, and So Should You. Jesus died for the church. He gave his life for the church, for his bride. I don't have any sympathy for people who say, I love Jesus, I just don't like the church. The church is the bride of Christ. I mean, how, how would they... Uh, Look, I just put it on a human level. If you make fun of my wife, we're not going to be friends for very long. Just so you know. Okay? I mean, it's not going to work out very well. You know, oh, I like you, Brother Don, but I don't like your wife. Actually, I'm sure that would never happen. It might happen the other way around. <laughs> I might say, Courtney, I love you, but Brother Don's kind of... But, but no, it, it's, we're a package deal, right? 
And if so, so if somebody doesn't like my wife and says bad things about my wife, we're not going to be friends. And so for you to say, I love Jesus, but I don't like his bride, makes no sense. And John says it's a good indication you're not even in the faith. And so Peter here says, honor everyone and love the brotherhood. Number three, he says, fear God. Fear God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, and fear God. I love that, just two words there, a verb and a noun. Who are we to fear? God. Now people still kind of get nervous about that word fear. And I often hear people try to, try to worm around it and say, oh, it doesn't really mean fear, it just means respect. No, it's much more than respect. We're to respect everyone. We're to honor everyone. You're to respect your drunk neighbor. You're to fear God. Now sure, we're to respect God, to honor God, glorify God, and all the rest. The Bible makes it very clear, we're to fear no man. But we are to fear God. We are to fear God. And that's why, and, it, and it's, but it's a tricky one to talk about. Because, and that's why, actually, that's why I got us to read Exodus chapter 20 earlier. A uh, very familiar passage to most of you, the, the Ten Commandments. But we read a few verses past the Ten Commandments. And did you notice that verse 20? Moses says something that's very interesting if you think about it. There, what's happening there, if you remember what just being read just a moment ago, uh, they're, they're on the side of Mount Sinai. God has just given Moses the Ten Commandments. God is revealing himself in thunders and lightning and smoke, and the people are terrified. They are scared out of their wits. They don't know what's going on. And they are cowarding. They're far away from the mountain. And they are, they are repulsed. They are scared to death. They're quaking in their boots or, I guess, sandals, whatever they were wearing there in the, in the desert. They're scared to death, right? And they even say to Moses, Moses, uh, you speak to us. Because if God speaks to us, we're afraid we're going to die to die just from the voice of God. They were scared to death. And Moses says something very interesting. Verse 20, he uses the word fear twice. First he says, don't be afraid. To calm their fears, don't be afraid. Which interestingly enough, I've read, is the most um, frequent command in all of Scripture. Over 300 and something, 350 times. Uh, so one, one, one person said it was 365 times. I'm not sure if that's exactly accurate. But over 350 times, the Bible says, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. And this is one of those occurrences. The Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, Moses says, fear not, don't be afraid. Because God is doing something. He's testing you so that you will fear him. <laughs> if I was there, I'm like, I'd be like, uh, Moses, you're talking about both sides of your mouth there. You just said, don't fear, so that you can fear and not sin. So apparently, there's a nuance there, there's a distinction there that Moses wants to make sure that we understand. On the one hand, it is not a simple, straightforward, nothing else included fear and terror but it's not less than that. So we're not to fear, but we are to fear. Don't fear God, but fear God. Maybe I can explain it this way. I love the passage out of uh, the, uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Uh, have you read that? If you haven't read that, if you haven't read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, shame on you. You need, you need to read uh, the classic work by C.S. Lewis, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia. They're kids' books. They're kids' books. But he, he makes analogies to the Christian life that are so very interesting. And there's one passage where uh, Lucy and Susan are at the beaver's uh, house. Uh, not leave it the beaver, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. Uh, they're actually, it, I mean, it's a kid's story. They're actually beavers. And so he's at Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's house, and Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are telling Lucy and Susan, I can't remember if some of the other kids are there, uh, and about Aslan, the king. And this is when they first learned that Aslan was not a man, but he was a lion. And the, and the beavers start to describe Aslan. 
and the terror uh, involved and, the, and, his, and, his, and his voice and, and all the rest. And they, they start to get a little scared. And, and, and Lucy or Susan, one of the girls says, Aslan, well, is he safe? And here's the classic line that I wanted to point out. Uh, Mrs. Beaver says, oh, no, he is not safe. But he is good. But he is good. He's not safe, but he is good. You see, we want, we want a God who is safe. No, he's not safe, but he is good. Aslan there is the Christ figure in the story. He's representing God. And our God is a terrible, using that word terrible, as one who instills terror, a terrible yet good and gracious God. And we must understand both. It is Jesus himself that says, do not, Matthew chapter 10, do not fear man who can kill the body. Now, killing the body is pretty scary, if you ask me. <laughs> I mean, I, I was trying, I was racking my brain this morning. I can't remember. I should have asked my wife, Courtney, but just uh, the other day, uh, we were talking about something. Now I can't even remember what it was. I was trying to remember it this morning. We were talking about something, and she said, well, the first thing that could happen is you could die. Uh, oh, that's, that's all? You could die? That's the worst thing that could happen? You could die? And, 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 and there's a real reality there. Jesus says, look, don't fear someone, even if they can kill you. That's all they can do is kill the body. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 10, I'll tell you who you need to fear. You need to fear the one who can not only kill the body, but cast your soul into hell. That's who you need to fear. I'll tell you what's wrong with many in the evangelical, in evangelical churches these days. We don't know who God is. We don't have a true fear of God. We look at him as just the man upstairs. I mean, let me tell you right now, and I know I'm going to I'm sound like there's some anger in my voice. I pray that it's righteous indignation. Do not say in front of me, the man upstairs. The spirit in the sky, the big daddy. He is God. The third commandment says, take not the Lord's name in vain. He is holy. He is reverent. What we need is some preachers who will stand up like Jonathan Edwards and paint the, pe the scene as he paints in this famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and help us to understand we are like, like spiders on a spider web being held in the hand of God over the fires of hell. And if he just breathes the wrong way, you will be cast into hell forever. That is the God of heaven who created your soul. Peter says, fear God. Fear God. We walk around flippantly. And you know as well uh, that I am one who loves to laugh. I love to joke around. I love the light things in this world. But heaven and hell is at stake. And there's a God who deserves to be feared. And we need to understand the reverence and awe and terror that his presence deserves. He is not safe, but praise God, he is good. He could cast your soul into hell. He is righteous, he is holy, he is just, but he is also loving and gracious and kind and merciful. And so we praise this God who we fear. Peter says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king, or the emperor, whatever you want to call him. Honor the king, honor the emperor. Now, we need to read this in the context that we've been looking at over the last few weeks. There's something very interesting here. Well, I, before I do that, let me make sure that you understand something. Peter is not, definitely not, and I don't think anybody would, would think this, but I'll just go ahead and say it. Peter is not building a, a, a stepladder here of, of importance. You know, we're to love everybody, and then a little step above that, we're to love, I mean, we're to honor everybody, and then a little step above that, love the brotherhood, and a step above that is to fear God, and a step above that is to honor the king. 
No, that, that's, that's not what he's doing there. That's not what he's doing there. I think what he's doing actually is bringing it back around to the beginning, and I'll, I'll clarify that in just a moment. But here, what it, let me do is sort of insert all the discussions that we've had over the last few weeks where Peter has been sort of going back and forth to make sure that we're balanced. Remember, he explained that we are sojourners, we're aliens, we're pilgrims in this world. The, the civil magistrates of this world in reality don't really have any ultimate jurisdiction over us. We are strangers and aliens. We, we are not citizens of this world. He said that is true. But then he says at the same time we need to make sure that we live at peace with our fellow man in this world, and therefore we need to submit to all human authority. And then he comes back and says, but in your submission, you need to live free. Remember, we're slaves of God, not man. So you see how he's going back and forth, back and forth here? And it, so it's in that context then that he says, honor the king. Honor the king. Honor the civil magistrates. Now remember, when he says honor the emperor or honor the king in his day, remember, he was put to death by that emperor. He was put to death by that emperor and still says, honor him. So what does this word honor mean? Does it mean to go along with everything that they say? No, we've already de dealt with that. I love the quote from Benjamin Franklin, even though Benjamin Franklin was not really technically a believer. He was coming at things from a Christian worldview, at least. And he says, he says defiance to tyrants is obedience to God. Now, I love that quote from Benjamin Franklin. Defiance to tyrants is obedience to God. And sometimes we must defy tyrants. When their demands conflict with God's demands, we must defy tyrants. Peter, the same Peter that says, honor the king, honor the emperor, is the same Peter that says, we must obey God rather than men in the Acts passage, remember? And so how do we, how do we weigh those two? Well, first of all, let me say, we must. It must be a possibility or else Peter would not be explaining it to us that way. And so honor does not necessarily mean walk in lockstep obedience to everything they say. But neither does it say that we should dishonor them, disrespect them. And I think that's very applicable to our day today, especially in our day and age when we have a president in the United States of America that goes so, that, that trumpets those things that the Bible calls abhorrent. Peter says, honor the king. Does not mean don't correct. We're to honor our children even when we correct them. We're to honor our brothers and sisters in Christ even when we I mean, what's the most loving thing that you can do to a brother or sister in Christ when they are in sin? Confront with them with that sin and, and call them to repentance, right? And so honoring the king does not mean that we go along with everything that they say like lemmings. No, but it does say that we do so, even in defiance, with honor and dignity and respect. I'm not going to try to elaborate exactly what all that means in every particular situation, on social media, in conversations, and all the rest. But I, believe, I think most of you understand that balance. They were to say with Peter, we're to obey God rather than men, and at the same time, honor those who are in authority. And work out how that will look in our everyday lives. One more thing about that that I think is a little ironic almost, and I think Peter is doing it intentionally. And I noticed some of the translations, um, unfortunately, I don't under, understand why they did it, but I, I think it was unfortunate. And, and that's why I kind of gave my own translation this morning. Some translations will translate that first, uh, and, and these, these four things. The first one is respect all men, or respect all people, and then at the last, honor the king. They put a little variety in it. But Peter is actually using the same word. And, I think, and, and so I think what he's doing there is he's kind of giving us a little, a little wink almost when he says, look, we're to honor everybody. 
And he uses the same word that you're supposed to do to everybody for the king. You, you, see, what, you see what he's kind of subtly saying? Look, the emperor still puts his pants on one leg at a time. He's just a man. He's just like me and you. Now, his station in life deserves me to mention him separately in this list. However, I'm not going to use a different word for him than I'm going to use for everybody else. He's created in the image of God. Even if he's an atheist, even if he's a God-hater, he's still created in the image of God. And we're going to show him honor where honor is due. We're going to speak against his policies. We're going to, and, and praise God, we live in a country like America where we are still, at least at some level, free to say those things. But let's make sure that we're careful the way that we say those things. Do you hear my heart as your pastor? As Christians, we need to honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank you and praise you, Lord, for your word. And I pray that this passage would work into our souls and that we would apply it to those many relationships in our lives, that it would help us to interact with our spouses and our children and our parents and our brothers and sisters and our neighbors and our friends and our co-workers and those that we come in casual contact with, our brothers and sisters in Christ and even the civil magistrates and everyone else, that we would do so appropriately and rightfully and Christ-honoring. Continue to teach us how to do these things. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.